On the third Sunday of Pascha, the church commemorates the Sunday of the Merberas, women who were ministering unto Christ in various ways and who loved him exceedingly, loved him so much that they were never afraid to go and do those sorts of things that his apostles were afraid to do and actually fled and hid themselves. Such incredible courage they showed in preserving the faith that was given to them at that time. They were um, able to approach the pagans at that time, the Roman em um, Empire and everybody else, not, not in the least bit scared that they were followers of Christ and believed in Him. His apostles, of course, as you know, fled and hid in various houses and in various rooms, as we read last week, on account of the fear of the Jews, who were particularly after their heads, because they were the followers of Christ, who they knew was the Messiah, but did not want to recognize Him as such. And we see that on this particular Sunday of the Merberas, we commemorate, the church commemorates the, the day of the um, God-bearing women in various forms. Not just those mer-bearers, but all women that bear the image of Christ in themselves and, and follow Him and minister unto Him. <clears throat> right up to our times, right up to our times, we have good examples of this in our own lives. The 70 years of communism that the countries endured in the previous century, the faith was so attacked that literally millions of people were put to the bullet and killed in various ways because they confessed Christ. Yet, the bearing, the bearing of that true faith was somehow deposited into the women of those countries. In Russia, it was the babushki, the, the ladies who went to church no matter what. Even if there was red guards standing outside ready to shoot somebody, they did not care on account of the courage that they had. They preserved that faith. Knowing that in time, that whole thing will burst open, that the door of the, the stone that sealed the sepulchre will be blown away, and that they would be there to give back to the rest of the world the faith that they had pre preserved in Christ, and that those countries would not perish because of those pagan and anti-Christ forces that were trying to run it. And indeed, that's what happened. That's what happened. When I was first in Russia in 1999, I spoke to some of these older women that preserved the faith, and to their own families and whatever, and their families were saying to us that it was only because of them that we are returning to the church, because they know what it was all about. For us, for all these years since we were brought up in the schools and in universities, institutions and at work, the faith in us was continually put down, that it was considered as something rotten and bad and unworthy to be in, you know, involved in. But the old ladies preserved it and gave it to the children to the adults and to the teenagers who very quickly, very quickly were able to raise up the standard of orthodoxy in those countries. It did not take um, decades or centuries as it, as it had in many other places, but virtually overnight, churches opened up, started to be rebuilt. Um, thousands and millions of people fled back to the faith on the count of these myrrh-bearing women. By myrrh-bearing women, we mean women who bear myrrh, who bear the truth of Christ in their hearts. Because that flows out and it becomes sweet to the person who accepts it. It becomes pleasant to them. And again I repeat that women have a particular importance in the church which they do not have to seek like those who are outside orthodoxy. Continually seek the role of women in the world. The role of women in the church the role of women in society. If they continually seek it, that means they've lost it. Where are they going to find it? They're not going to find it in secular writing. They're not going to find it in the ones that have departed from the faith or in the new philosophies and the new isms that come out. Turn back to the true faith and you'll see what this so-called role of women is. And it's to be immersed. 
It's to be immersed. It's that simple. It's to have Christ to understand what it is to salvation, to pass it on to their children, to pass it on to their neighbours, their um, grandchildren, to show by example, by with the courage to go to places where persecution is rife and not be afraid because Christ is there and they are bearing that myrrh even to those who don't believe because many that didn't believe when they saw these sorts of things happen and they saw the courage and the faith they themselves turned right from the very first beginnings in the, um, the um, gospel we read how many of the Romans actually after seeing what happened, became followers of Christ. Many, many thousands. And that really ushered in the, the first persecution against Christians. The first ones to be persecuted en masse were from the Roman, Roman um, Empire. Um, the soldier that stood by the cross, St. Lazarus, um, Lawrence, St. Lawrence, he was fried alive. And the... <coughs> grid that they fried him on is still in the um, Vatican today. You can go and see it. Um, maybe not the Vatican, one of the other churches in um, Rome. So you see, all these things came to pass on account of the fact that these women came unafraid and saw the risen Lord, that the Lord was risen and went and told the rest of the world. The other aspect about, about this is that in addition to being the bearers of this myrrh from themselves, from their own heart and soul, the women are expected also, those who are married, to bring forth Christophores, to bring forth Christs in their life. You see? So what is this problem about finding a position on how women can serve the church? There is no problem. The examples are all there. Read about them. Find out about them. Even from the Gospels right up to our own day, we have those in our um, life as, as testimony to this. And if these new philosophies about putting women in charge of various situations, believe me, they are not God-pleasing. They are not God-pleasing. And why is that? Because the fall came essentially through the woman. When... Um, paradise, she convinced her partner Adam to sin. The myrrh-bearing women, the women like um, Mother of God and that, undid all that. They sort of undid that curse that laid upon women and made it all new again. Why do they want to go back to the same situation? Why do they want to go back to rule over the world because you know yourself who the ruler of the world is it's antichrist it's satan that's the ruler of the world so if you're joining up to be a ruler of the world you have to join up with antichrist i often wonder what does it mean when it says in various novels and all sorts of talk that a person has sold his soul to the devil what does that actually mean you know, do they actually go and pay money or something like that? Or What it means is that inside yourself, in the very depths of your soul that, that, that makes up what you are and what you follow, Christ has been replaced by some other thing or some other attitude or some other desire. And you may not even realise it unless you look at it very carefully. What do you want in your life as such? What are you striving for in your life? What do you really, really want? Because if you really want the things of the world, that means you have already sold yourself to that. You have not sold yourself to following Christ. And if you do follow Christ, believe me, you're going to have troubles in your life because the rest of the world hates it and will attack you. And most of all, the demonic powers inspire these other people to attack you because they know that you are on the way of silver, to the path of salvation, and they want to knock you off that. So examine yourselves. What do you really want inside? What do you really strive for? What would you want if somebody came to you and said, I'll give you anything you want right now. What is it that you want? 
You know, if you want riches, wrong. Power, wrong. You know, gl uh, glory and glamour, wrong. Because that is all selling yourself to something else other than to being a myrrh-bearing woman. And these sorts of things, both men and women should understand that um, Christ, that God created male and female for very good reasons to live on this earth. After the resurrection, there will not be that distinction that um, male and female, that we're, there, there will not be marriage and given in marriage, as they say. Those sorts of things will be taken away. But right now, there is that distinction for a very good reason. Christ needs souls to fill up the kingdom of heaven. And male and female together do that. They fill it up. Otherwise, how else is he going to do it? The demonic race of which a third fell into um, oblivion, into hell, has to be made up with human souls, with those that are to, of the race of God, the race of God, because Christ became one of us, so we're the same race as him. And on account of that, the devil is pushed aside, the angelic hosts that fell are pushed aside, and a new creation is taking that spot. That's why there's so much anger from that, so much hatred, so much killing of human beings. Believe me, even though the um, evil one appears in various disguises of good, in the end, the whole idea is to destroy that soul. And may we be um, very, very understanding of that and know, try and study how that occurs in your life. That's why we have all the spiritual books, to see how that works in us. Be very careful of that and um, observant of that. Vigilant. Vigilance is one of the great virtues of spiritual life. Be vigilant what's going on inside yourself, what you are striving after. And through that, you 